We started off with two of us, um, myself and Paul founded Flight Club. Um, and this was just taken maybe two months ago. This is, so this is our creative and technology team. So there's 56 of us now. And we have some of the best brains from, um, we have guys from NASA who, this is all in-house now. So we have guys from NASA, from Sony, from Disney, um, some of the best game artists, um, vision technology guys, because it's such a commercial setup what we do now. So on the, on the IT side and the infrastructure, because we've got venues in the US and in the UK. So um, yeah, so our offices are in Islington. So we've kind of gone from two people to 56 in the central team in just a few years. So it's been quite a journey. That's an awful lot of payroll, Steve. Yeah, it's, a, it's an extremely punchy <coughs> payroll for central team, considering kind of what, what we are. But we invested very heavily, very early in building what we best is like the absolute dream team. We're having everything in house so we could achieve what we needed to do. I mean, it, it, yeah, it took to convince quite a few people that Flight Club was doing very well, but to reinvest it, reinvest it into um, these guys here, yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so um, this is. <laughs> It's a lovely slideshow, isn't it? Did it about two seconds? Um, so this was the beginning about five, no, about seven years ago when we first came up with the idea of um, Flight Club. And just to give you a background, why I believe um, our concept has done so well over the last four or five years is the fact that we took the humble dartboard and we focus grouped the shit out of it for maybe three years. We did something like 300 focus group. Each one was six hours long. So it's every single night. Um, it was in my garden shed, and then it was a pub, and then it's back to my garden shed. And we developed uh, four games, but we didn't lead the game development. We created a framework, and we, we had tons and tons and tons of strangers come over to my house every single day, a stranger's friend and another stranger's friend. So by the time we launched this technology, we'd already had something like 150 versions of the software. Um, done by Scrum Agile that we used um, that, that took three years to develop. So by the time we launched Flight Club, we had what felt like a very commercial product. And more importantly, because we had thousands and thousands of people help us build it, we had brand ambassadors from day one thinking, you know, that they was their idea. So let's go back though. Mm. Why did you think you wanted to change darts? I think we were in a pub in um, Croydon, Devon. It's Croydon, not Croydon. Um, and we, we, it was a rainy day and there was like eight, nine people around the dartboard in the afternoon losing their mind, like boys and girls. And we were like, oh my God, what happened to this when we grew up in the 80s? It was a big thing. Just kind of that very communal feel. So we honestly, when we first came up, uh, there was no technology whatsoever when we first came up with it. And then we realized that you were just so bound by certain many, many rules by not being able to do it. So that, that is not practical in a pub, is it? All those magnets and <laughs> all, that, all the chalk. So we realized that we needed to layer, <coughs> layer technology into it. And it was nearly, like it was right on the edge of impossible. So Hawkeye, 300 million pound company backed by Sony, failed miserably in trying to score a dartboard. Uh, Windmill failed, Unicorn, so people spent millions and millions in doing it. So we cracked the code with this guy from NASA because it's a, basically a three camera system and it does a billion calculations. It's probably the most over-engineered like thing of all time. So it's a billion calculations, um, guys from NASA working on it to score three darts. And then once we did, once you could do that bit, we paralleled development, the gaming. So we had a gaming engine that we worked with um, some guys from Disney that I knew who are now all in house. So we ran the gaming engine, the scoring system, and it was only about a month before we opened that we thought about that we best connect the two. Um, we connected the two, somehow the comms worked and then the, the flow goes between the two, yeah. So we took it from a two player game to a 28 player game. So I know you want taking you back then, okay. Mm -hmm. So you sat in this pub in Croyd, which yep. is lovely. Croyd's a lovely part it's of the very, um, yeah. So were you working then doing something else? Yeah, so I was a um, futures trader. So completely irrelevant. So the only experience I have in hospitality, when I was 14, I was a glass collector. Though I was a pretty good one, I think, um, for a month. <laughs> I did. Um, so absolutely no uh, background at all. But I think but coming up with the idea, that I think it was actually very beneficial that we had absolutely no experience in hospitality because we just built the team. So I had a bit of a background with technology, being a trader. Um, my maths is good. But uh, I think it was all the experience from the, from the f uh, fire engine. I was like, OK, I don't know anything about hospitality. My friend was a general manager for Stonegate. And I was like, what is a wet 
why do people say wet? What does that mean? And like food and all this sort of stuff. So um, we built this absolutely ginormous team, convinced a, a whole bunch of people come on. We had 43 um, friends invest the uh, best part of two million pounds in our concept. It's um, still a very odd thing to do. Um, uh, yeah, and, and we, uh, it was kind of cool because everything we questioned, we just questioned hospitality because parts of it is quite backward. They were using something called a fax machine um, to send invoices. I was like, what is, this, what is this machine? What are you doing? So, yeah, I think it's kind of handy we had no background because we had to really ask and w l um, learn everything. So I think when you say 43 investors, everybody's mm -hmm. thinking, wow, I bet you're getting dragged all over the place with this. Yeah. But you did something sort of to avoid that, didn't you? How did you set things up so that you didn't end up getting dragged around by your shareholders? Um, well, it was, it was the Articles of Association. I think they basically, every, like everybody kind of invested in us because of the fire truck. And they were like, well, you, you managed to achieve that. So we're not quite sure what you guys are up to, but it's probably a good idea. But then I think the UK government was amazing with EIS and SEIS, these tax schemes. So it kind of protected that. So the only person I didn't let invest was my mum, just in case it all went completely wrong. I had somewhere to go. Um, yeah. They're, they're all very happy now. I bet she's really annoyed problem. now, though. Yeah, she? she's absolutely devastated. Yeah. Yeah. But all my friends are happy. So it's fine, yeah. <laughs> and then, so, so, we, so we took it from this for three years, but we, um, at the same time as developing the technology, we had to do absolutely everything. So this was a very bold, big move. We, 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 we didn't want to do one dartboard and then launch it. So we really committed to a 400 person capacity venue in Shoreditch, the most knobbish area in the world. Everybody's a food critic, drink critic, bar, interior, and we, like, we just really went for it. Um, so we spent three and a half years working on the interior design, the brand, um, like everything, food development, drink development, took everything super seriously. It was kind of cool being on that site because we knew that, you know, especially on food development, we were just going to get like, destroyed unless we took it very seriously. So like, there was so much to work on. There was probably a team of about 70 or 80 that helped launch it in the end, um, which is pulled in every favour known to man, yeah. So slide? yeah, we went from this one to, yeah. So, Overnight, we went from, that was my shed, and then we went to, this was one of the 12 playing areas in Flight Club Shoreditch. That can get um, something like 28 people around a dartboard, super quick, super fast. Um, yeah, it's, it's badass, and um, it worked. We had, um, so we only had, the, on the, one of the test nights, nothing worked. We had four or five coders working 24 hours a day, trying to fix it, didn't know what it was, and then something worked, and we still don't know what actually fixed it um, since we've rewritten the entire code. So we've now got about 140 playing areas in the world. We've got nine venues. Um, and now it's like bulletproof commercial military grade um, IT systems to be able to c deploy all the software. I think we've got about 38 different bits of proprietary software under the hood. So everything, everything behind that is kind of all, all everything we built. So everybody says to me, how can I get Flight Club's system then? <laughs> they they, a, 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 they can't. No. Uh, so, do you have a patent on the on the camera system, the tracking system? Yeah. So we we got patents on a few parts of it. Um, the reason why we don't license the technology is the fact that Flight Club and the social darts aren't mutually exclusive. It's when you're in that environment and you see the beautiful bar, it's just like yes. And then, but if you if you take one away from the other, I, I think it's quite jarring. So actually, the, the two sit together. And in terms of this interior design then, because it's, it's been beautifully created in all of your venues. So the first one was Shoreditch. Mm -hmm. And so did you design it? Did you get somebody else to design it? How did you come up with the stunning look? Because it's, it's been in virtually every presentation so far today. They've, they've <laughs> used your photographs. Yeah. So we worked with, um, so I came up with the majority of it just by um, going to lots of little pubs. And then what we wanted to do was make it feel, because what people honestly do still like is cosy little pubs, but they want it on a, on a grander scale. So this is a bit, they're big, big venues. So like Flight Club Victoria is maybe 750 capacity, um, but it feels like it's a semi, it's a semi private space in a large area. So it's very, very popular um, with the female dem demographic because they feel safe in the semi private area, but they're still in the mix of everything else. Um, so I designed it, so it, I'll be honest with you, I just got extremely drunk with uh, Russell Sage, who is a, um, actually a restaurant designer, he used to work with um, some of the big names, and we just wanted to combine the fairground and the public house. So we wanted to bring the pub back, which we have done, in a, 
you know, in a, in a little bit more of a high energy way. So we just, we opened Fly Club Islington in November and that is really bringing the pub back. When you go in there, it's on Upper Street. It's, it's, it's one of the most dreamy pubs you can ever go into, yeah. It's a smaller venue, isn't it? It is, yeah. So um, to put it in context, so this, um, Shoreditch has got 12 of these playing areas. Um, Islington's got four. And Victoria, or Las Vegas is going to have 24 next, this year. So there's a big kind of swing, but they all feel intimate. So where's it going in Vegas? It's next to the wind. Really? Yeah, it's a nice touch. What, in, in, in the wind? No, it's right next to the wind. Oh, and opposite wow. of Venetia. Okay. Should be right. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so, the, so I think the next slide was kind of what Flight Club, um, oh, it's a video. Yeah, right, should fine. we do the video? Okay. So what is quite interesting there is actually, so all of the um, data you saw earlier today um, is kind of the opposite of what we've seen, if I'm completely honest. Um, so what we've seen is a, because when we first built it, they said like the millennials will, won't drink there and January will be challenging with this dry January thing. Um, so, the, so our venues nearly average 70% of sales are alcohol led. 70% and the cells are big and we're seeing millennials really go for it there and we see um, J January is one of our biggest months so I don't know if like we don't we don't adver advertise you know anti dry dry or anything like that but honestly <laughs> like it's insane the, the demographic on a Saturday afternoon it'd be like 22 to 25 year old it was 80 90 percent female 23 year olds um, heavily drinking. <laughs> so um, I, I think that the stats are true for the overall market, but if you do something crazy engaging and the high energy, I think that the, 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 the wet cells can be there and they can be sustained and they can be sustained throughout the, the January and the February uh, months. Yeah. See, I, I think that it's interesting to pick up on those stats because mm. a lot of those stats are driven by consumers answering questions yeah. They're designed to elicit a certain <laughs> response, potentially. And they're not coming from retailers that are sharing what they're seeing. So it's really interesting to see what you're seeing. I mean, some of, our, some of our peers are saying exactly what the stats said. I mean, I think what's quite interesting, I think you're right, is that sometimes they go to a fly club or electric shuffle and they honestly think they're going to have a relatively calm night. And because you're immersed, you're so immersed, and you're, everything's vertical, you suddenly go, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I think that's why January is quite funny for us. People are popping in on a Monday. Like, we're so busy on a Monday night, and they're just popping in for a quick snifter and a game. Yeah. And then, oh, bloody hell, it's happened again, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I've just got hammered. <laughs> Um, so this image, just to get you past this image, so we have, to, we have to flick on from this image in a second. This is what downstairs in one of our, this used to be a car park in Flight Club Shoreditch, and this is what it used to be. And then if we flick on to get you off this picture, so this is what it is now. So um, yeah, we, I think we, along with some of our peers, um, have really committed to a, a, a significant capital expenditure model. So Flight Club Victoria, for example, cost five and a half million pounds to build. These are very, I think, like you said about the, uh, the people taking pictures of the venues and caring about the interior design, like you cannot be average anymore. You really, really do have to go for it. And then if you go to the, this is upstairs in Shoreditch. Um, this is what it looked like before, which is pretty, um, pretty sexy. And then this is what it is now. Um, so like you just cannot limp in. I think it's quite tough sometimes if you've got, I don't know, but rather than, I just got to really go for it. And it doesn't have to be expensive. It just has to be, you have to put so much love and energy into interior design and customer experience and everything like that. So. But I think that's, that's the thing you can see. I mean, we sort of showed the pictures from, uh, or the videos from Swingers. Mm. The same sort of meticulous eye for detail has gone into that. Every piece when you go around the venue, you know, you can see it in yours. Yeah. Every single piece has been thought out. It surprises you at every turn. You want to go and have a wander around the whole place. Yeah. You know, you want to see what it all looks like. It might be a good bit you've missed. 
Um, so with, really with cool. Victoria, it's uh, got so many different parts of the adventures. We have a disco telephone box. We have a room of there's 1,406 cuddly toys in the room, um, and people, our dwell time is somewhere between seven and eight hours in a bar, which I think the average is normally about 65 in most bars. So people kind of go there for a day or a whole evening and just can't leave. Well, you have to be fair. You have to go up a hell to scale to get into it. So I think once you're in, you kind of like I can't be bothered to leave now. So and Victoria is not particularly great as an area. So, but fundamentally, our dwell times are probably three to four times more than a normal bar because because of the energy and the and the decor. What what we got next? I can't remember. There we go. So this that just wanted to show you before and afterwards. So that is before. This is Victoria, which is just basically a horrible little um, box. And this was the Victoria bar, which was the yep. It, this is the UK's longest bar now, but just the, the amount of detail. So every single panel on there, there's something like 190 panels were all hand painted in our studio. So I think just to really, really iterate that, I think to do well, you really have to really care and go yeah. for it and commit. And then this was actually only about two months after Flight Club launched, we started working on Shuffle, because <laughs> we needed something to do. Um, so it, after three and a half years development, we launched Electric Shuffle in November last year. So this was the table, and then it's like a two-player game, and then we go to the next slide, and this was the Electric Shuffle. So using similar technology, camera systems again, we track um, eight pucks live, and again, it does something like about 100 million calculation every second. Um, we took it from a two-player game to a 16-player game, 10-player venue. Um, we're just building our second site in London Bridge and one in Dallas in the US. Um, so what I, what I really like about Shuffle is very, very similar to social darts in the sense that you have an amphitheatre, you've got all of your mates around it, and... Um, yeah, and the and the and the and the, and the F and B around that is insane. I would say it's even more than Fly Club, because you've got your shelves down the side, you've got your seats down the side, you've got your canapes, your champagne, or your prosecco, or your beers. Um, it is it's it's bonkers when it comes to people how much they consume on the F and B side when they're immersed in a game. So why did you do shuffle then? I mean, you've got Flight Club, mm -hmm. which is taking you so long to build that. Test it, test it, test it. Surely you had enough on your plate before deciding to do this as well. Yeah, but we, we, we thought there were some synergies in the technology and the customer experience, and there wasn't. But we got, we'd already gone down too far at that point, and we really enjoyed it. So I, it's just such an enjoyable game. And then we realized that, oh my God, this re the, the focus groups, we, we, would, we, we went through the same thing. No assumptions we did. Um, six nights a week, we did focus groups in our office with our, all, all, all the technology. And same again, we were like, they were just going nuts. The focus groupers were going nuts for it. So we were like, so we just kept progressing it. And um, yeah, the feedback has been tremendous here yeah, since we've been open. So is there going to be another? No, this is definitely it, mainly because that we see real scope in both of these brands doing particularly well in, around the world. So we just really want to focus on, on these two. So what's, what's your plan then? So you've obviously got two shuffles going mm -hmm. so far, one open, one coming. Yep. What further rollout plans? Yeah, so we're looking to do three to four a year in the in the UK mm -hmm. of of um, Flight Club or Electric Shuffle, depending on opportunities. And then we are now looking at in, uh, more international experiences. So this year we've got Washington and Vegas opening, um, Atlanta as well, and then probably in Australia as well. So wow. I think, it, uh, but but it's all about how well we can do it. Considered our velocity is generally a function of people rather than capital or or build, because no matter how good all this is, if you look at all of our customer reviews, they don't even mention the technology as much as I wish they did. They don't, I don't think it's ever been mentioned once, it, it's the staff. So it, look, we have to keep the DNA of all the venues and all that sort of stuff. So we can only really go as fast as we can with our training academy. If we keep the DNA, then I think we can do three, four years and keep the DNA of the, um, the venues. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was, was the, the staff. When we first met with you and Paul, you know, we were in Shoreditch, it was closed, but there was such a good vibe between you and Paul and your team. But, you know, I think it was Josh came to me to, to see you. How have you engendered that? How, because you're on such a journey and finding good stuff makes or breaks the business. So how have you done it then? I think the, the leadership team says nine directors now, 
Um, it's about spreading the load on there, and um, all the uh, we set our vision, uh, our vision, mission, and company values very, very early, and we got the team. The team made it, not us. So we did that. So all, um, all the re remuneration, all the awards is all done if, um, if you show the values of the business, not on fin financial performance. So I think that and just still caring and still being involved with, I still put all the pictures up in a venue <laughs> when they open. I really like it. Um, it's getting a little bit impractical now. But um, I think it's, it's just how you treat all the staff. You know, there's 600 now, maybe something like that. And it's all about how well and if you care, they care. Um, and fundamentally, what's kind of cool is after all the venues shut, say, 1 a.m., the, the teams there play till like 5, 6 a.m. in the morning, every night. You can just see, like, you can see all the stats, and they're like, they've been playing all night again. So, like, they're all hooked. They're yeah. all hooked on the gaming of the venue. So, if the, if the, if the staff love the product, then <laughs> Jamie or I. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, let's have a look at the video of... Um, oh, that's the bar. Um, okay, go on. Canary Wharf is quite pretty, isn't it? There you go. So who came up with this? Because this is mental. Yeah, so we, we, look, we, um, this is a, a material designer that we work with. It's Alan Ellis Studio. Um, but a lot of it's done in-house now. But um, we worked on like kind of really dialing up. So there's not one element in Electric Shuffle that is the same as Flight Club. So that's a big kind of turbine-y, underground-y thing. Just lots of cool elements about electricity. Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. <laughs> it, it looks something like this. And that's why we do it. There we go. Do we have another one? That that's another it. Somewhere. That's it, yeah. So, just going to give you all the opportunity then. I think Steve's been brilliant in terms of being so open and talking about everything, the whole sort of journey from start to where he is now. But I think he's going to be good enough to just be got six minutes of questions from the floor. So, anybody got any questions they want to ask? You've got six minutes, guys. <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's fine. Yeah, oh, there's, one. there's one. Well done. Fantastic. Hi. Um, so I've got a question. I get your point around there still being lots of foreign millennials out there. I'm one from time to time. Um, but I think it is probably a bit more about people choosing where to get drunk, which is to your point about it needing to be kind of more aggressive and engaging. Because it's like if I'm going to bother to go out and have a drunk night out, it's probably going to be more than just getting wasted in a kind of classic environment. Um, but to that point, I also think that people always want to go somewhere that's changing. So how do you, and do you think people come back to Flight Club, and how do you change it up enough so that people feel like they want to go back? Um, yeah, so what we do is, so because of the interior design, what we've done is try to create a, an environment where you go anyway. So 50% of our front of house is, is bar area. So what we find is that we, we have people who visit us weekly, maybe once, twice a week. So maybe on some concepts, it's like once a year if it's quite a big random concept. So we've actually become people's kind of turn to local. Um, but how we get people, how, how we change is, so we, we spend a lot of money on the venues on constantly changing the look and feel of them, changing the bars, particular layouts, um, more pictures, all that sort of stuff. But more importantly, because of the gaming, because everything's in house, we have a ginormous pipeline of like we've rebranded the gaming already twice, extra games, we've added action replay, we've got all these bits that you can now share on social media. We, we kind of built a mini Facebook on the side that, that gives you a story of your event the next day. 
we, we run, we've got a tournament software, you can have almost 300 people in a game. So all of these, all of these um, product updates, so whenever the customer, customer comes in, new DJs, different nights, so actually it just feels completely fresh. So Shortage is now four and a half years old and it's up again, it's like it's had four years of growth in a row for a concept that some people might think would be quite short term is actually it's, got, it's getting sustained um, growth. So I think you've got to keep innovating all the time. And if you, if you are lucky enough to have all the proprietary software and the, and the interior design and everything in-house, then that means you can adapt really quickly. Otherwise, things take too long. Great stuff. Anybody else? Who's next? And now you've got electric shuttle as well, would you ever consider having both in one venue or do you think it's important to keep sort of a focus on one model? I mean it works, some, some people have done it really well about having multiple kind of um, activities. I think the, if you take the gaming out of it, electric shuffle and flight club from an interior, interior design are like two different worlds. Like I said, there's not one tile, there's not one, one element that's they're so different in their look and feel. And the gaming part of Electric Shuffle fits into the electricity world of that brand. And Social Darts and the Oki fit into the world of the pub and the fairground. So they're kind of two different worlds. And we don't cross promote, they just, they just live in their own little worlds. But um, I think some, some guys have done it really well, having multiple activities for us. We just really load up like chips in on, on one thing. Um, so yeah, for, for now, no, but you never know. Like if we go to the smaller model, maybe if you do one like in a town, would you potentially like give both? But I think, I think you'd really trip over yourself big time on interior design. That's mainly because we've created a world for them to live in. Some people who have added games into their existing bars have done well, but they haven't, their interior design doesn't reflect what they're doing on the gaming as well. Super, we've got time for one more. Anybody else? Good man. There you go. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, you mentioned how important the staff are and your, uh, your training uh, scheme that they go through. Can you just shed a bit of light what happens there? Yeah, so we, we've got a big training academy now. Um, stuff like the games masters and the bar team and all that sort of stuff so what we did was we so the original flight club shortage team were like so into it it was like the first ever flight club created the most beautiful team and then what we've done is each of the original founding team which is about 80 or 90 of them from that venue some of them now in Manchester some in Birmingham some in Leeds some in different parts and what we've tried to do is is get them to be the new brand ambassadors who move it into another team into another team um, and it's been hugely successful for that. The great thing about um, a growth cycle like ours is that if you do well, you get promoted because there's going to be an opportunity to be a GM there or be an AGM there. So we've had floor team that are now AGMs or going on to a GM just after four or five years. So it's a lot of motivation. But the, the training academy is a big thing for us and understanding kind of why they do it. A lot of these guys are really career people. This is why we're not overly happy with the whole UK kind of angle at the moment, especially in London, on trying to protect um, and like to prevent European workers working in hospitality, because especially in London, like the, all the talent is European. Outside of London, like Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham, it's a lot more in English in the UK, but certainly in London it's... I think it's an interesting point to pick up on. There's been a lot in the press the last couple of weeks about it. Mm. Just, you know, do you want to elaborate a bit more on your thoughts on what can be done, because it's going to impact the hospitality industry massively isn't it? Well it will do. Uh, currently, and it, um, currently um, a lot of European who are generally in my opinion in, in the London are, are, are quite phenomenal, very career driven hospitality guys and they really really care like Polish, Swedish, um, quite phenomenal, the French um, and it doesn't seem to be that way at the moment with British people, um, you won't see an AGM, go, want to go to GM, you just don't see it, you do, you do see it um, outside of London, so I think it would it would it would massively affect, um, especially all the London concepts, if they start putting a squeeze on trying to protect only having British workers work in um, in hospitality. Because I think, like, I just don't think that pool is there. That mm. desire, I'm not sure why London, but it's not great for us. But honestly, but the, how cosmopolitan and how international um, the staff are it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. We really enjoy that part. Brilliant. We're out of time. But it's been amazing. Great journey. Show your appreciation, please, for Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thanks,
Hoxboter.